In this lesson, we want to look at some of the beneficial possibilities from the volcanic and geothermal heat that come out of our planet. And part of that story is to find the places where that heat does come up. The Ring of Fire is something we'll look at in this tape. For those of us in North America, the idea of Yellowstone Park is very familiar, and that's an area where heat flow is not part of the Ring of Fire, but heat coming up under the continent. How much is this heat flow? It's actually about 110 times higher than heat flow almost anywhere else outside of Yellowstone. Here, straight from the cabin at the Old Faithful Lodge area, an eruption in progress as we arrived, just visible from the cabin door. How wonderful and perfect can you get it? The footage here of Mammoth Hot Springs with the storm clouds in the distance is almost surrealistic, looking more like a painting than, than reality. Uh, lunch is on for us, and we would like to do some more stops this afternoon before we have likely thunderstorms. The Circum Pacific Ring of Fire all around the Pacific Ocean comes from the idea that there are volcanoes here in South America, Tierra del Fuego is the land of fire, if your Spanish is good. As we come up, the Andes Mountains are all volcanic, come up through Mexico, through some of the western United States volcanoes like Mount Lawson, Mount Shasta, Mount Hood, on up the Alaskan and out through the Aleutians. All volcanoes would come to Kamchatka, the Russian Peninsula, and we will visit that one some geothermal energy considerations, down through Japan, on around, even down to North and South Island of New Zealand. And what is common, at least here in the Western Pacific, is this dark blue trench. And that's the indication that the ocean floor is indeed subducting and going down under the continental masses. And as it does so, it takes water and carbon dioxide down, maybe from shells and shales and clays, and those are released at depth and come back up, triggering volcanic activity, hence the Ring of Fire. It will be fun to take a trip to one of these places on the Ring of Fire. The Japanese culture has for many, many years been interested and fascinated with the hot springs and the ability to have bathing, and also, of course, geothermal energy from their volcanoes. Let us go to such a place, Hakona Volcano and Ajiwara, inside of the crater at the top of the mountain. We can join an international field trip that went there in 1980 and many people interested in the development of geothermal energy that the Japanese were attempting here. Wind is carrying the sound better this way also. The path that Rosemary Vidali is walking on here, we were told by Dr. Secchi, had in fact been just rebuilt in the last two weeks because of the instability of the slope here. Later in the morning, as the wind blew some of the fog out of the caldera area, uh, Lake Ashi is down below as a caldera lake. But here at the summit, uh, we see some of the equipment being used to try to do the geothermal drilling. But the topographic stability of the slope is just very insecure. We can leave Japan behind and go on up the Ring of Fire to the Kamchatka Peninsula and see what the Russians have been able to do with their extra heat coming up 
from the subduction zone of plate tectonics. The Kamchatka Peninsula is a really remote area. To get in, we'll take a helicopter, and we want to go to several of their calderas and the hot heat flow areas, almost like our own park at Yellowstone, a place called Uzon Caldera, and a place called the Valley of Geysers. We're assembling at the heliport and hoping that the weather holds so that we can do this flight. So here we are, we're airborne and flying over the countryside on the way to Uzon Caldera and eventually the Valley of the Geysers. It became very clear how completely empty of roads and civilization this countryside is. It may truly be one of the last frontiers on Earth. And as promised, here's the caldera that Dr. Herkrugan had shown us pictures of back at the gold camp. The blue color of the water is just spectacular against the walls of the volcano. And of course, that's water in a caldera lake at the summit of this volcano. The helicopter had about 28 of us aboard, and as I've already started to comment, one has the feeling that if this helicopter went down, even without a crash, uh, you'd be pretty isolated. Any chances of walking out of here would be minimal, not that you would suffer for water, but probably for food. Uh, there simply is no easy transit through the volcanoes uh, without probably mountain climbing gear we saw in the map some of the uh, extreme rugged topography. Here we've landed at Uzon Caldera. <laughs> the Russians have built a rather crude daka or log house here. And as we pan around, we see the walls. The walls surround us in this caldera. It's a huge okay, depression. Приблизительно в 180 километрах от города Петропавловска. Approximately in 180 kilometers. A more active kind of geothermal area here in the caldera, and necessary to take some precautions with uh, the proper boots and so forth for being able to walk around in this uh, saturated area. Obviously, uh, surface water being heated by the volcanic um, heat within the caldera, panning around uh, the rim of the uh, crater. Many of us were eating the blueberries here in the bushes and being told by the Russians that the bears also come because the volcanic heat makes the growing season a little bit longer and the berries bigger and more abundant. And then one of Terry Seward's postdocs, who we just saw unloading the <laughs> helicopter, informed us that she had measured a very high arsenic and selenium and so forth in these waters. And we're all kind of wondering how much uh, arsenic was in the blueberries. So walking out across some of the geothermal features, the sulfur <laughs> uh, growths that occurred in the hot water, uh, underwater, with a pencil there for scale, like a little funnel condensed uh, sulfur uh, in this very hot water. One of the gentlemen that had uh, thermally insulated waders went into this and would feel around and pull these up as uh, souvenirs. You see the very active uh, gas and heating going on here from the hot gas, presumably sulfur rich, which is what and then, as we're walking around, some bear prints that are not all that old. There's no septaria cracks in the bottom of them, so they hadn't yet even dried out. Many of the kind of standard old geothermal features, nevertheless beautiful. Uh, the hot water, powered by gas and heat, uh, roiling up in the caldera.
panning across the area, yellowish of the sulfur and a fairly strong smell of hydrogen sulfide. So some very active uh, uh, hydrothermal type uh, deposits perhaps being made here. The high arsenic that was measured by Leanne and some of the other geochemical data that were given to us. Leaving here we have helicopter jumped and landed and this is the view down the valley of Geysers and uh, Kamchatka. Naturally all of us <coughs> on our particular helicopter this first day's trip went down and enjoyed seeing up close uh, all the features. Your cameraman hung back to try to get the panorama and document that the water ac action group really had gotten down to the canyon. It was, it was really excitement, not knowing where to look first, breaking in on the quiet beauty is almost doesn't need any kind of narration. A great, great experience. Looks like pretty thick porridge. Kashka, sorry, we're in Russia. down the valley and to the rear, back towards where the helicopter had landed, and with uh, mood lighting coming in with a big cloud bank, it's just like you're in another world. The sound sounds like a drum in the bowels of the earth. I'm waiting for the wind to blow it away so you can see what it is like two potholes here. green. A little more active one right across the path. A nice sludgy brown. Red brown. Basic rhyolite with all the colors of the escaping heat.
kind of risking that the geyser doesn't go off. Here is uh, looking right down my foot in the picture for scale, uh, such as a small geyser. developing geyser pipe where the water would uh, issue forth in this cylindrical hole. So, as you're watching this, this pattern should be kind of evolving in your thinking. Too much heat, water in the surface of the earth, and what develops are mud pots, geysers, steam, and all of this brings with it at least the possibility of harnessing some of this energy, perhaps using the steam to make electricity in generators that are turned by the steam. Because there are no roads in and the helicopter trip is not exactly cheap. As we take to the air with the helicopter and head back out, one is struck with the co-parallel ridges of the volcanic ranges along Kamchatka Peninsula. Here looking a little bit to the west, uh, one can see in the mists to the horizon. What we had seen on the map, that there are two complete ranges of volcanoes. The one that's inside the peninsula is older and has only one active volcano. The one near the shore is the one that's over the shallow portion of the Benioff Zone. And so, after a wonderful helicopter ride, we come back to the dinner and the final exit from Kamchatka and the field trip. This again is one of the international groups of scientists that meet every three years to study geothermal energy. They call themselves specialists in water-rock interaction. You can see all the different faces and races perhaps even represented here. People from Turkey, from Asia, from England, from Europe, from South America. And we're all sharing the experience and trying to learn in the process. It's 10 o'clock at night, the party is just beginning and we haven't gotten our passports against the departure tomorrow. other kinds of high heat areas, the mid-oceanic ridges and the heat that they bring up on the ocean floor. So let us go to Iceland and look at the map where the oceanic ridge intersects Iceland. The map we see that it actually splits and makes a letter Y whose tail is down here. One part of the Y goes to the north, one goes to the northeast for two different volcanic fields in Iceland. Let's zoom out and see Iceland in the bigger perspective of the whole North Atlantic. And in fact the whole world. We'll jump right into the middle of Iceland, where the Kropla area is sitting exactly over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. One side of Iceland is on one side of the Atlantic Mid-Oceanic Ridge, and the other is on the other side. Now we have switched and are up at the Kropla area and are starting to look at the central Iceland and northern Iceland geothermal areas. The idea here is one of great tectonic activity and tremendous thermal leakage from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Very typical kind of geothermal area with mud pots, all different varieties, some with more mud, some with more water, and 
the warning sign, which you may have been able to read while I was talking, warning the visitors to not go off and step anywhere where the ground is white because of the possibility of this kind of thermal activity being underneath. stay upwind with the camera because of the smells. except for not having footage from Yellowstone when the camera got ruined by Old Faithful. I could do little of this at Yellowstone. whistling in the background was wind. Here are the two field trip, at least two of the field trip principal leaders, Halder Amundsen and Bjorki Smarason, and the excellent work as we've already commended them for earlier in this tape, having done to bring us to these areas with all the kinds of logistical details that they had. Here on the bus, we are approaching the formal Cropla field with some of the newly drilled wells because many of them, as we were told, had been wiped out by previous volcanic activity here in the Cropla area. Here at Cropla, there's almost too much of a good thing. As you're now seeing, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, at least one part of it, goes right through Cropla, and the heat sometimes becomes so severe that a volcanic eruption wipes out the wells that have been drilled to drain heat for energy production. In 1984, an eruption occurred in the Cropla area and took out some of the previous wells that had been drilled. One of them even erupted through the well and it was a very hard time for the Icelandic geologist to quench that activity. One has to remember that in Iceland there is not a very big tax base and each of these wells could cost a million dollars. Here Repna Chrisman's daughter is showing us some of the aftermath the most recent eruptions. Art White and I have discovered another still smoking rift. And then panning around at Mivatan, the lake that has all these volcanic features, it's essentially a course in volcanology in one small area. I think every conceivable kind of cone, ash, strato, shield, flat top, all the different morphologies of volcanology are right here in this pan. Dave again is doing a done button scene here showing me a caldera on one of the rootless volcanoes. Here we are now over on the rift itself where the um, water accumulation in uh, perhaps it's a lava tube has gone as you saw from the sign to 60 degrees centigrade. The rift is thrown up on one side and uh, perhaps down on the other but at least displaced upwards on this side. We are standing essentially right on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and several of us had to go down and explore to find out that the water truly was 60 degrees centigrade way above the ouch point. But an interesting, and here's the group standing on the uh, Graben itself photographing backwards towards the rest of the group. Other signs of rifting here where the earth is pulling apart and still smoking from the heat leaking through. Another group 
on another day showed us the ash chronology that could be done on some of the ash flows that have erupted through historic and even prehistoric times here at Cropla. And the group found this chronology very, very interesting as we dug open a sample trench. Others of us were a bit more joking about it, and here George Kikandis is trying to get high on the mid-Atlantic fumes, uh, maybe playing the Delphi Greek oracle since his ancestry is Greek. Then we also, in a more serious vein, all of us, I'm sure, enjoyed tremendously getting off, even though it meant walking some distance, as we're seeing here, to the field at Cropla to the 1984 flow and seeing the rhyolite core to it here, the yellow ground, and also the dark black ground as we saw the group walking towards of the 1984 flow. The ground here is so unstable that the power station that was built here has tipped seven degrees from one end to the other, and Haldor Amundsen calls it the world's biggest tilt meter. Here we are panning out from some of the ropey lava where we see the 1984 flow lost its temperature and the Aa and Pohoihoi stopped right against the gra grass and mossy surfaces. Tom Patches is taking pictures of some of the unusual morphologies, uh, so fresh and yet cool enough, although still smoking, to be able to walk out and look at it. Here is one of the tilt meters that the Icelandic group did put in. They put a drill hole at each end of this long pipe and put the pipe up with the break in the middle. The tectonics did not break the pipe, but the pipe was left open, and they expected perhaps to see some dilational tectonics. However, most of what's happened here is up and down vertical separation of about two feet. Here Dave is hamming it up again, showing that it's really separating, but not, maybe not quite as fast as he's indicating. Very beautiful scenery here. I know I'll remember it always. I suspect we always, all of us will of the rhyolitic yellow ground against the very fresh and still smoking Cropla flow. Here we're leaving the Cropla field. Um, since we had been doing research at Cropla, it was with a heavy heart. Other field trips during the stay in Iceland, we of course got to see the, the world type geysir, or geysir. Here it is shooting off from a distance. And the geothermal leakage here into the water table, of course, the classic explanation for geysers. The activity here in Iceland at the geyser is so much different than Yellowstone. First of all, one dare not get this close at Yellowstone, although I ruined a camera there a couple of years ago trying with park ranger's permission. But here the water heaves, as I'm sure we all remember, and works itself into a frenzy, and then finally does cut loose as we're seeing. After their option, it's running back in. Geyser is much more unreliable than our old faithful, working apparently on no fixed time schedule, so I've just essentially missed one more eruption of it here. But walking around the field, very interesting to see the silica crusts and the hot water pools. Here Tom Patches explores one rather cautiously because we're not sure which ones erupt and which ones don't, having only been here for the first time. Another feature of Iceland, of course, is the tremendous waterfalls. There being so many glaciers with copious amounts of meltwater. Here we are at Gullfoss, and just spectacular scenery with the knowledge that we do have that much meltwater. The glacier must be close at hand, and as one pans around, uh, the first moment is, is that a cloud, or is that a glacier, or is it some of both in the distance? And as we pan in, we convince ourselves that it is a glacier with perhaps some cloud formation just above it on the higher elevations around us. What a panoramic view. We're looking now at glacier and cloud. And of course, 
some more in this shot. The idea that the Worm or the Wisconsin Glacier retreated back across Iceland about 5,000 years ago and left the Yoko uh, Glacier, the, the largest sheet of ice uh, on Iceland as a remnant, is certainly accepted, I believe, by the glaciologist. And as it continues to shrink, uh, at least on the overall pattern, the tremendous meltwater coming off, as well as any rainfall falling on Iceland, gives an excellent chance for water rock people to get right down to the water and the rock here and do some sampling and even tasting uh, of the water. You don't have to duck, Mary. That's a good part of this. Yeah, I know, but it will have a truck to blur in the front. It's not exactly what we're talking Now we are at Gadafoss. Legend has that in the year 1000, when Christianity came to Iceland, the idols were thrown into this waterfalls as an act of reborn faith. This is from the Vatniskol Glacier, and so is the typical cloudy, milky appearance. As we've said, Iceland, the name tells the game. Much ice. This ice was formed during the last global continental glaciation when it came all the way from the North Pole down into Illinois, Pennsylvania, New York. And this piece that's being pointed out by the arrow is what's left is not having melted out as the ice retreated back to its present position in the Arctic. The water that is being generated from this melting because of the heat of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is tremendous volume, but one has to realize that most of the ice is already melted from the continental ice sheet and this is the last remnant in Iceland. So eventually they may run out of water but currently they're using this meltwater and the heat from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge to produce electricity. Reykjaberg, the power station, here's the manager explaining to Dr. Grandstaff that the water had trickled down from the melting glaciers some 2,000 years ago and gone into the ground to become the geothermal steam. If you recall, this gentleman served us all geothermal punch with rum in it, and uh, here's the setup for our geothermal punch. Clearly, a couple of us had way too many geothermal punches because here Dr. Grandstaff is in trouble again. He's cutting off the steam supply for Reykjavik. Only kidding, folks. Outside, we went to see some of the wells at the wellhead that actually feed the Reykjavik station. Very simple inside, running at fairly low pressure, supplying water at about 90 degrees centigrade. Not only for carrying hot water, but for carrying groceries. Yeah. Woman is returning from market carrying mm -hmm. laundry or groceries, whichever. Up the hot water aqueduct. How, how far does this go? Down? Um, or is this is this just a local feeder line for these houses? Yeah. You see, we have also the wells up here, and we have also a degassing tower and pump station. Here we are with the flags at a government installed pumping station on the hot water aqueduct. It actually is the primary source of hot water right here. The telltale is this tower, which is a gas separator to allow the pressure drop to take out CO2 and hydrogen sulfide and have the water pumped into the aqueduct, which then goes back on down the peninsula towards Reykjavik. 
even though the temperature is about 25 degrees centigrade, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, I think you can see the steam, the hot water, a bit of overflow coming from the degasification tower here at Reykjaborg, meaning smoking rock, and the pumping station on the hot water aqueduct, sending the hot water from this well into the main distribution system of hot water back along the Reykjanes Peninsula. As we're looking back up along the strike of the conduit here, the two brown tracks are in fact the well sites. Bringing the hot waters to the surface. Iceland history is tied up with the Vikings in their exploration sailings out of the Fennoscandian area of Europe. When they arrived in Iceland in the sagas that surround their history something like 800 years after Christ or AD, Iceland was a very inhospitable, cold and not at all friendly place. It stayed that way because of the lack of very much ability to stay warm in these latitudes until actually World War II when the countries of Europe were squabbling for a submarine base on Iceland and geology was brought to Iceland for the first time. History reflects that in 1941 the British landed on one side of Iceland and the Germans on the other side both wooing the government to have the exclusive rights for a North Atlantic submarine base during World War II. History tells us that the Germans were not welcome and the British were welcomed and in that moment, the geology technology was brought to Iceland to start to drill into the mid-Atlantic ridge and exploit the geothermal energy. We're looking out, as I talk, the window of the power station, and we see how far things have come since 1941. The quality of life in Iceland has certainly improved with the availability of electricity and geothermal heat. In the development of Iceland, the Danish government has also played a significant role. And when the Germans were essentially asked to leave, it was by the then existing Icelandic government, which had its roots very much in terms of education and culture in Denmark. The map on the wall in the lower left at about 8 o'clock has the Reykjanes Peninsula sticking out. And we're on that peninsula at the Swartzingi power station where there is problems with intrusion of seawater, so the water is not all glacial and fresh water, but some salt. This adds some engineering problems because the steam is very salty and more corrosive on the extraction and turbine. Here we're at another place on the Reykjanes Peninsula, Nesla Lavir geothermal power plant, and you see the plumes of the wells there, each one of those steam plumes. Again, recall that this could be a million dollars, and so there's a fair investment here in terms of drilling to get steam to make energy either as hot water or electricity. Think, each plume you're seeing here is a million dollars. There's a lot of money invested in trying to find energy in Iceland. I'm checking to see my watch. It's now 6.24 at night and it's still quite daylight because we're so far north.
Right now, I'm throwing chill. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. hot, dancing waters.
something still. Is it still running? Did you push the second? 